Hello. Hi. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe I'm know, sitting so here excited. with you. It's so exciting to sort of just kind of be yeah. in your presence, be in this presence together, this new generation of whatever it is that we're doing. It's so exciting. And, I feel the same. Um, so just to get to it, we both have shows where New York City is an actual character yeah. in the show. Mine in the 80s, yeah. now second season in the 90s. Yours is in the 50s. 50s, late and 50s? It's, we start, well, the flashbacks are to the mid-50s, mm -hmm. 1954, but we started in 58. Yeah. We're approaching 60. And so what is it like, what's the difference between the, the New York of that time and the New York of today, what do you feel? Well, so much has changed, but what's really cool, and I feel like the same is true for you guys, is that we are able to shoot outside yeah. in New York. Because yeah, yeah, while yeah. so much has changed, so much has not changed yeah, in terms of what pockets. it looks like exactly yeah, in certain yeah. pieces of the city. Um, but I mean, New York has changed a ton since the 1950s. For one, people don't dress like that anymore. Oh my God, those clothes! <laughs> I know. And you guys, oh my God. I know. I, the clothes on your show, the styling. Yeah. Donna Zakowska, our costume designer, is a freaky genius person. And one of my favorite parts about working on every episode is walking into Eric Winterling, where they where they make all of the clothes. Mm -hmm. do you, where do you guys make yours? Uh, well, a lot of ours are purchased. Okay. A lot of them from vintage, oh, cool. you know, spots. Yeah. And, uh, and they do make some stuff. We yeah. make it on set. We make it. Our, our own oh, wow. people make it, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well, is walking in to like, see all of Donna's inspiration photos mm -hmm. laid out yeah, all over yeah, the fitting yeah, room and amazing. fabric swatches, and she's got vintage magazines everywhere and photos of, of Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly mm -hmm. and Marilyn Monroe, and, and she's mostly looking for shapes yes. and then creating different yeah, costumes silhouette. out of them. Yeah, it's, um, at costume fittings might be one of my favorite part, but shooting in New York, has been incredible, and it feels like you're time traveling when mm. all of our background actors, we use a lot of background actors, yeah. start filling the streets. Um, and that, the cars. And the cars. You have to change the cars. I think that's stuff. everyone's favorite part, is when we start <laughs> shooting outside, no one cares what we're shooting. They all want to take pictures <laughs> with the vintage car. <laughs> you shot on a friend of mine's street, and he said, we came out one day, we were in, inside all day, yeah. and we came out. It was like, wait, where are we? Where are we? It, it really, it really feels changes like we it. Yeah. Went into a time machine. But you lived in New York yes. in the eighties. Yes. Well, I I started coming to New York City in eighty seven. So really close to the time of the show. Yeah. How do you feel like it's changed since the eighties? Well, you know, first of all, Forty Second Street has become Disneyland. Yeah. Which, yeah. for better or for worse, I you know, yeah. obviously it's for better. Um, I sort of sometimes miss. The grit, mm -hmm. meaning the realness of it. You yeah. know, there's sort of a patina yeah. Yeah. that's over it right now, which is, you know, what are we going to stay in the in the dregs? Yeah. So I get it, but but to have that background, mm -hmm. you know, to really know what it felt like, yeah, you know, to be in a city, you know, I came out as as gay in '85. Wow. Um, it was the middle of the AIDS crisis. Yep. I started um, coming to New York, like, like I said, in 87. From um, Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh, uh -huh. yes. And did my, um, you know, my first Broadway show, Miss Saigon, in 91. Wow. Um, it was a dark time. Yeah. It was a dark, dark time. We were living through a plague. Yeah. Um, and it was a group of people that, you know, it felt like nobody cared about. Yeah. And that sort of cloud, and that sort of cloud was hanging over the yeah. city in a really hard way. You know, but the great part about it was that, and I think this is what infuses the show, mm -hmm. is that the choice to choose life Mm -hmm. anyway is such a powerful thing yeah it's a powerful tool to have in life in general and you know you can't have a testimony unless you have a test mm -hmm. you know and so to have lived 
through that and to have been blessed to have lived and get on the other side of it. Yeah. And then be presented with a show like Pose. I was going to say, how does it feel to be recreating parts of that moment and also with so many younger actors yeah. of a brand new generation? Yeah. What's that like on set? What was it like shooting the pilot? It just takes my breath away because if I'm being honest with you, I never felt like this story being told would ever be an option. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that I was thinking that yeah. in my brain, in the subconscious back part of my brain. Yeah. You know, my dreams have always been huge, mm -hmm. you know, but they've always been springboarded off of something that I had already seen. Sure. Mm -hmm. Never the impossible. Yeah. You know, Stephen Canal's our creator, Ryan Murphy, the entire team has taught me with this piece to dream the impossible. And how does it feel? Because you're working with so many actors who are making their, who are, who, for whom this is a breakout role. Yeah. What's that been like? And do you, have they like come to you for advice? Have, have, <laughs> like, are you, do you feel like you're an authority on set like you are in the balls? I, you know, I am the I mean, kind not, of person. Not in an asshole way, but no, you know. No, 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 I know. I know. I'm, I'm the kind of person who, you know, if you want it, yeah. I'm there for you. Yeah. I try to live by example. Mm -hmm. You know, just being the presence yeah. very often is enough because I see, you know, they're all like sponges and they yeah. all, the whole cast, they really want to learn. Mm -hmm. So it's really special yeah. um, to be in a position where I can uh, sort of be like the daddy. Yeah. Listen, I was always the youngest. And you will learn one day that that changes. That's <laughs> all of a how sudden, I've you, mostly been so far. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and what's that? All of a sudden, you wake up and you're not the youngest anymore. Um, you're actually the oldest. But it, but there's, I, I enjoy it. You yeah. know, I enjoy it because I have lived and I do have something to say. The category is high fashion evening wear. Ladies of luxury, why are you in a nightgown? A lady do need beating for a formal fashion affair. It's chiffon. I want to talk about with you the rhythms. Mm -hmm. You know, the very specific rhythms of yeah. both of our shows. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a musical component. Yes. To both of our shows. Like a heightened reality. A heightened reality yeah. that the music is really important. Very often our yeah. episodes, I don't know if this is with you, but very often our episodes will be named the title of a song. Like very, very oh, often. I didn't notice that, but you're so right. Very often they're named the title of the song because the rhythm of the song, the lyric of the yeah. song, and as a musical theater performer, yeah. there's a connective tissue for that with yeah. me. Yeah. That like gets me into an episode and into the character yep. in a different kind of way. I just want you to speak to the idea of that and the you know the 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 spitfire yeah. rhythm of the of the text, which yeah. is very specific and really, I think for me watching it really gets me right into it. Yeah, you know what is that like? Well, it's really unique, like yeah. like poses too. Yeah, um, that's just. Amy Sherman Palladino and yeah. Dan Palladino, that is their thing. And I, what, I love something that they said about it, which is that they don't, everyone always talks about the speed, how fast it is, how unusual it is, how different it is from anything else, but they don't feel that way. The reason that everyone talks so fast is because they think that that's how people talk in real life. Yes. That in real life, when you're at a coffee shop, you don't look at the menu and look at the server and go, I'll, uh, I'll have a... Uh, coffee with right. milk you know right. they go uh yeah i'll have a coffee with milk and blah, 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 yeah, you know yeah, yeah. and you keep talking and now that once they said that i was like you're right and obviously everybody has their own natural rhythm i'm learning through working on this show that mine's a little bit faster but it doesn't give you time to think and on our show that's a gift right but with regards to the music we often play music on set so with certain establishing shots for example in the pilot one of the first shots is of Midge sort of walking through Riverside Park. Mm -hmm. And to get 
much like a musical, to get everyone on the same rhythm, uh, they would play the music. Yeah. We'd do playback, and we'd all sort of march through Riverside Park together. Right, there's something very, um, you know, guys and dolls, Runyon Land, yeah. about the, and that really sets you, yeah. it sets you up when there's, yeah. when that heightened thing of yes. everybody walking at the same time, and the, the bags, well, and the hats, and the... And Amy hires almost exclusively dancers as background actors in yeah. scenes like that. So if in the B. Altman scenes, when we establish B. Altman, the place where Midge works, um, all of those background actors are dancers. Yeah. And if you look really closely, you can see them sort of poking yep. and touching and move, moving in one space. It's unifying. Yes. yes. And that's Amy's aesthetic, and she's unapologetic about it. My first everything happened in the Catskills. Everything. My mother first told me to keep my knees closed until there's a ring on my finger in the Catskills. Actually, she told me it was biologically impossible to have sex without a ring on your finger. <laughs> Amy obviously has such a, a specific voice that she has crafted over quite a few years yeah. in the business. So does Ryan Murphy. Absolutely. What's it been like working with Ryan? How did you guys meet? Did you get along right away? What, what's it been like? Well. I, the, my Ryan Murphy story is really about the law of attraction. Mm. You know, I have not had a whole lot of luck in my career with film and television mm -hmm. in terms of con the consistency sure. of it in the way that I have really wanted. I'm having this moment now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after Kinky Boots yeah. and after the Tony and the Grammy and all of that stuff, I yeah. thought, okay, all of that stuff. you know, all that stuff, <laughs> let, me pick, let, let me pick that up <laughs> off the, no, but for real, I just thought, okay, this will be my moment. This will be my time. Yeah. And it didn't really connect that way. And sure. I started looking at the landscape of producers and showrunners and creators. Yeah. And I thought, who's going to get me? Like, I'm big, I'm f splashy, I'm, you know, I, like, who's, you know, I'm really, really gay. Who's going to get me? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just saw, it, it was Ryan. And I just started, like. So you thought that before you guys had ever before, met? before. Wow. Speaking his name when? into the universe. I would say, I would say probably around 2013, 14. Wow. I really, it became clear that I needed to get specific. Yeah. With my dream, mm -hmm. not just film and television, but who, Yeah. who, you know? And so, I mean, I've been a fan all, you know, for years and years and years and years. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just thought he'll, he'll get me. So I started, you know, writing his name in my journal and speaking his name in conversations and out into the universe. That so and, much. You know, all, you know, I just started, you know, you have to, yeah. Speak what you want. You speak it into existence. And it was just Ryan Murphy off my tongue, off my tongue, off my tongue. And then I had a pilot season that was like horrific. Oh, no. Horrific pilot season, you know, I've just been there. dismissed. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, too flamboyant, that thing. You know, just, yeah. And the night before I got the call for Pose, yeah. I literally had a nervous breakdown with my sister on the phone. I was like, I'm done, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I don't wanna do it, you know? And then the next day, I get the phone call for Pose. That's amazing. And I'm just like, you've gotta be kidding me. That's you know, amazing. they told me what it was about, and I'm like, okay, you gotta be kidding me. Then, there was a, a I, was, I was being called in for the, um, for the dance teacher. Oh, uh-huh. Who, is yeah. Charlene Woodard. Yeah. I just thought, this is the wrong part, but okay. So I prepared it, I went in, I did the audition with Alexa Fogel, yeah. and I just basically said, this is the wrong part. I should be in this world. I grew up in that world, I lived in that world. It would be a waste of everybody's time if I'm not in that world, right? Yeah. And she said, speaking, she said, well, he wants to go transgender. Ryan Murphy really had that vision. Uh -huh. And that's what's so, specific about him and mm -hmm. so great about him is that his vision is always contextualized yeah. to how do I pull out the greatest lesson, mm -hmm. the greatest educational piece of this disenfranchised group of people? How do I get people to understand the micro inside of the macro? Yeah. You know, there's always a reason mm -hmm. for that. Um, and so he came back and he, you know, he came back and said, yeah, if you can do an impersonation of the, of the MCs from Paris is Burning, we'll create a, 
Love Paris. A roll for you. The recipient has taught us that a house is much more than a home. It's family. And every family needs a mother who is affirming, caring, loyal, and inspiring. You talked about how Ryan is always interested in, in the, the most authentic version right. and voices within yes. the community. What does it mean to have a show like Pose on in 2019? Well, it's the trans, you know, the idea of the trans and when I was told that the mothers of the houses were all going to be trans actresses mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. It's like that is the truth. That's the part that nobody knows about. Yeah. And now we're dealing with this whole group of disenfranchised people that the world has really not heard their story before. Yeah. It is breathtaking. And when I say so many people, I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. Yeah. I've been surrounded by these ladies and these men and still didn't understand the magnitude. Mm -hmm. Still didn't get it. Here I'm, I am on set and for the first time, I'm going, oh my God, the T in LGBTQ has largely been ignored. Yeah. By me, not because I didn't, but because I wanted to ignore it, but because I just, you know, yeah. we came out, we went straight to the front lines to fight for our lives and our rights. And then, you know, so, and then it just, yeah. The pill came, everybody got healthy, and everybody moved on. And it, it is, it takes my breath away. Yeah. These women teach me what real authenticity, these women and these men teach me what real authenticity is about. Mm -hmm. For real. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, that's something that's so beautifully explored on the show. And the performances have so deeply moved me and, and continued to, as you said, blow me away. And the transformation of some of these actors, some of whom, as, as we talked about earlier, it's their first role. Where were they ever going to do any of right. it before? Yeah. The transformation, even in watching the first season of yeah. how much they have grown is extraordinary. Yeah. And I can't, I can't imagine what it's like to work it's in such that environment a gift. every day. It's a gift. You know, I have this I have the same interesting connection to your show. Yeah. Because once again, we grow. When we know better, we do better. And when we're open, we grow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Never in a million years did I ever think that we would have a black president mm -hmm. before we had a white woman. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about the woman thing. <laughs> For real, the depth of it, yeah. the depth of it. Yes, yeah. yes, we all know, yeah. but like the depth of it. Yeah. That's what your show does for me. Cool. You know, it really reveals what women have had to endure. Honestly, I feel the same way about your show. Is it just shows that misogyny and, and the hatred of things feminine transcends just the biologically female community. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, there is a, there has long been this um, looking down on of right. all things feminine and female. Right. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I also enjoyed watching your so, so, show so much. I feel like it tackled that as well in a really nuanced way and in a way that I hadn't considered. Right. Um, but it has been a real privilege working on this show and it's been a real privilege. You know, it's a comedy and you never, yeah. like I, mm. I think I underestimated as someone who's never done comedy and never, never really? worked, no, and never worked in this space. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, never. Well, that's even more impressive. <laughs> Thank keep you. Going, but, keep going, keep going. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I drastically underestimated how much comedy has the power to move people. Yes. And through spending time with comedians, through doing research to help prep for this show. I mean, the world of comedy was so far into me. So I did as deep a dive as I could, but I didn't, um, I completely underestimated how much comedy has the ability to move people yeah. and to teach people as well about issues that are important. And uh, I have been so moved hearing from our audiences, the what they learned from the show, the different ways that they connected to it, the, the 
different ways in which it makes different women feel powerful. Yes. The theme is so universal, this, this idea of a woman finding her voice in a brand new way because she always had one. Yes. And she always had a loud one, this she particular always had a loud woman. One. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But finding it in a new way and being unapologetic about her pursuit of it and listening to the different ways in which that has inspired young women, old women, uh, uh, women from all different walks of life has also in turn inspired me. Yeah, I love this woman. I have learned a lot about myself playing her. Mm -hmm. I think something that we don't share is that unflappable confidence. <laughs> I feel like I've never been so terrified as when I'm standing on stage in front of a group of, of background actors gonna perform comedy. Right, no. <laughs> and it's been a process of reaching so deep and, and learning to feel powerful using my voice. Yeah. And that's something that, that we're all collectively learning at this moment in time. So it feels as relevant as ever. And, Absolutely. And I've, I've loved getting to bring that to life, but mostly to hear from other people about it. And so when you came up to us at the Golden Globes and talked about how much you loved the show, it was, and, and I'm a, a long time, very dorky fan. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was really, really special. The first boy I ever kissed, I kissed in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. First time I ever let a boy go Christopher Columbus on my nether regions, it was in the Catskills. And this boy, he was my papa. In terms of finding your voice, like, he, you have done everything. You've had so many surges of these huge moments. You touched on it with the Tony and the Grammy, and you've directed and written a play and become a singer and, and worked in an amusement park. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, I, I am just, what? And become a fashion icon again? Like, like what? What is there something that you haven't done yet that you're dying to do? Because I'm just watching you soar, having watched you soar from afar so many different times before. Yeah. Like, does this moment feel different? Is there something you haven't yet gotten to do that you're dying to? Well, this moment is really significant in that the platform yeah. has broadened. And yeah. what's really significant with film and television, it's just a wider audience. Mm -hmm. um, you reach more people in a, in a faster way, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. You know, for me, what's been significant is that I've been able to do it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. I've been able to do it based on being authentic, being mm -hmm. my authentic self. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I always say it's easy to be who you are when what you are is what's popular. You know, when I entered this business, it was not popular yep. to be black, gay, out in this business. It was not popular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I took every hit that came with that. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, there are peaks, there are valleys, I've gone, I've had all of them in my career. You know, about 20 years ago, I was watching Oprah, which I am wont to do. And, <laughs> um, you know, there was... You know, Maya Angelou was on, I think, Yala Van said they were talking about, um, you know, service. Uh -huh. And it was about the intention of service. If you choose service, everything will work out around you. Mm -hmm. And I was in a really tough spot at that point in my life and career. It was like, how can you be of service mm -hmm. in an industry that's inherently narcissistic? Yeah. Like, what, what does that look like? Yeah. And I was at a crossroads because people were telling me that my authenticity was my liability. Mm -hmm. You're too much of a sissy. Mm -hmm. You're not masculine. My masculinity was always in question. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to fix that. You're going to have to change that or you're not going to be successful. And it hit me like a ton of bricks because it was like, well, the, the service is inside of my authenticity, choosing my authenticity over my fame, choosing, my, choosing myself over whatever this show business thing could possibly be, yeah. right? That is the gift of this moment for me right now. Yeah. You know, and with as long as it took, because it was not easy, I'm gonna be 50 this year, I've been in this business for 30 years. Congratulations, Thank that's you. a big one. It's a big <laughs> one, and it's like, but now everything, 
is exactly the way I want it to be, exactly the way I need it to be. And I have to say, it's such a shock and a surprise. <laughs> it's a pleasant surprise. It's a pleasant surprise. Yeah. So in the process, you know, you spoke of not being a funny person, not having done comedy before, which blows my mind. <laughs> Thanks. Um, how did you dive into it? Like, what, how, what kind of research did you, add, what's the specific yeah. research that you did to find Mrs. Maisel? Um, it was really fun because it did feel so far away. It was terrifying to try to approach this woman. And honestly, I felt probably through the shooting of the pilot that I still didn't know who she was. And, and that was both thrilling and horrifying all at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I'm a research nerd. So the idea of learning everything I could in such a short period of time about a world that I didn't know anything about was really, really fun. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple friends who are stand-ups who gave me little tidbits and bits of advice. My, my friend Jasmine Pierce um, has, has done stand-up, but she started quite late. We went to drama school together, and then she began stand-up like when we graduated and, mm -hmm. and went from these tiny, tiny basement comedy clubs where you two drink minimum bringer shows, like hopefully you have someone laughing in the <laughs> audience who's on your side, to writing for The Tonight Show Wow! Um, in just a couple years. So wow. she was a huge inspiration for me. Yeah. But I, well, there was a little bit of misinformation that was sort of floating in the ether before starting this show, which was that it was about the first female stand-up comedian was something I'd heard. So I got on the Google and was like, who was the first female stand-up comedian? And I came across this woman named Jean Carroll, um, who isn't particularly well known by audiences today. But when I found her, I was pretty certain, without ever having met or spoken to Amy and Dan, that Midge must be inspired by her. Mm -hmm. She was a beautiful woman, housewife who, wore, who always had a string of pearls on on stage and a beautiful dress. And she spoke a million miles a minute. And what I loved about her is that I found some clips of her on YouTube is that she never waited for an audience to catch up to her. She knew she was the smartest, fastest, and sharpest woman in the room, and she knew that her jokes were good, and so she would blast through them. One of my favorite clips, she sets up a joke, and she hits it, and the audience doesn't laugh, and she goes, come on, come on, come on, you know, and then keeps going. And I right. was like, Catch oh, up. this woman is incredible. <laughs> and it turned out that Midge Majel was not inspired by Jean Carroll, but I think I definitely borrowed pieces of her yeah. to help bring Midge to life. Um, borrowed bits and pieces from other women in my life that I've known and loved and admired. Um, my grandmother, June, being one of them. She just, she was a woman who was of this time, who was divorced at this time when it was really taboo, which was yeah. a huge deal, who had uh, six small children, you know, and, and it, was, it was a big deal. But she was never afraid to use her very loud voice. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I just, you know, like I didn't know her at that time, obviously, but I think of her when I was growing up. You know, I'm, I'm a natural blonde, but when I first dyed my hair really dark, she hated it. And I just remember her sitting in bed, like holding court and us all coming in and her going, Rachel, what in God's name have you done to your hair? <laughs> and I went, well, Grandma, I, you know, I dyed it. And she went, well, put it back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Midge Maisel. <laughs> uh, so it's been, it's, and it's been a constant process of discovery because at first, starting the show, what I clung to for dear life as a non-comedian was this idea that Midge is also not a comedian. Yeah. She's a funny woman who's been through something horrible. Her entire life has shattered and she doesn't know any way but forward. That's the kind of woman that she is. And that her stand-up at the end of the pilot isn't really stand-up at all. It's, it's a minor mental breakdown, you right, know, in a right. very funny way right, in front of an right, audience. Right, right, right. So I clung to that for a long time, that she's not a comedian, she's just talking, she's being exactly who she is, and that mm -hmm. crafting the woman was more important than learning the comedy. Mm -hmm. But as we've gone on, and Midge is becoming a better comedian and a more technical comedian, we've had kind of a parallel journey. I've had to learn that too and have been so, so fortunate to be surrounded by comedy experts like 
Alex Borstein yeah. and Tony Shalhoub oh and Amy and Dan and Maren Hinkle yeah. and Michael Zegan. Everyone in the show has done comedy. And I feel like I am given a crash course every single day showing up on set. And it's been, it's been a, a real growth. I think it, it feels silly to say this now, but I spent most of my life being told I wasn't funny. Um, that I that I would well, never, you know, I mean, I'd, mm. I'd gone in for comedy auditions and and been told, you know, like, we think she's great, you know, send her back in, not for this, she's just not funny, mm -hmm. and had sort of absorbed that as a part of my identity, and not, not even necessarily in a way that felt really negative or dark. I just right. was like, I'm a dramatic actress. I should not try my hand at comedy. That's not really in for my lane. Else. And and yeah. <clears throat> uh, and so I have learned so much being part of this show, learned to dig deep, to find um, a freedom in things that are terrifying, yeah. to be bolder and braver because I'm playing a woman on camera, which never lies, right. who feels that bold and brave moving through the world every day. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's ongoing, which is the gift of TV. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm excited to continue this journey. The, the 1988 award for Mother of the Year goes to my sister, Blanca. Has there been a moment from a fan or someone in your life talking about how the show has moved them that has stuck with you? There are so many of them mm. at this point yeah. that I can't even count. And that's the service part. Yep. You know, I'm so moved by all of the people, but really particularly the little black sissy boys, mm -hmm. the little black queens, mm -hmm. you know, the ones who are told that their existence on the planet is unworthy. They're unworthy of living. Yeah. You know, the little trans kids, the little ones, yeah. you know, who reach out to me and their social media and they reach out. Yeah. You know, and to, to be able to be present for these people, yeah. representation does matter. Yeah. To have somebody to see and go, maybe I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can just get through the quagmire of whatever this mess is right over here in this time yeah. and get to the other side, I'm gonna be all right. I'm gonna be able to find my tribe. I'm gonna be able to find my family, my chosen family. I'm gonna be able to find that. Yeah. Because it exists. Yeah, yeah. You know, that is the most powerful part. Yeah. Of what we're doing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, similar to you, there have been quite a few that have really, that have really stuck with me. Yeah. Um, I'm one of one of the ones that I love, which is kind of goofy, but but so powerful, is that I've heard from a lot of women who have said this show inspired me to write or to pick up a microphone and and to try stand up myself. And at first, I was like, wow, that's really you know that's really funny. But actually. Beneath that, the idea that not only did the show inspire someone to maybe find and use their voice, but to use it in one of the loudest <laughs> ways humanly possible, yeah. I think is pretty cool. But on top of that, I had a, a girl who wrote a letter to me and sort of the cast in general saying that um, she had been bullied in school uh, for a couple reasons, but also specifically in New York City, which blows my mind, for being Jewish. Um, and she said that watching this show that so celebrates Judaism in addition to so many other things, but, but Judaism is a part of our show at the center and it's approached in a funny and familiar way. Yeah. Uh, made her feel seen. Yeah. Um, that that it, she had started to feel like that part of herself was maybe not worthy. It was something she was being 
bullied for. And uh, and she wrote a letter just saying that this show made me feel like I could walk through the halls with my mm -hmm. head up high and, and that it was such a celebration yeah. um, of, of, all, of all those things and, and women in general. And I, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. When, when you're talking about perception and you're asking about like, you know, the gender thing. This, there are tiny acts of resistance all over the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And in addition to this, this again, this woman's got- Maybe not a, so tiny. Well, from those but, of us but there watching, are they some are... tiny ones. Yeah, there are yeah, yeah. huge ones. Yeah, yeah. In addition to some tiny moments that have really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about this a couple times, but one, it, it seems so small and I think most people didn't even notice it. But in our pilot, there is a moment where Midge takes all her makeup off at the end of the night and does her perfect little curls and puts her little hairnet on and goes to bed and then wakes up before the sun rises. And people talk about that moment a lot. But even in the shooting of it, I took all of my makeup off on camera. Mm -hmm. And I have been a part of other shows where when you take your makeup off or when you are asleep, you have a full have face a full on. Yeah. And and everybody tries to say that it's it's not, you know, it's, it's just about, you know, making sure that there's no redness. And, I think part of, that's one very small, very like micro way yeah. in which this show feels different from so many others. I yeah. think a lot of that has to do with having a female voice at the head of this show about a woman at a time when women weren't at the center of their own stories. Yeah. History is about men, told by men, largely absorbed and then recreated by men yeah. and in in some very small ways and obviously some much larger mm -hmm. ones. That's been one of the great privileges of being a part of this show. Yeah, I noticed that too. I noticed that that happened on, that happened with, with Miss Viola Davis too on how to get away with murder. Yes. Very specific. I love that moment. It's very specific. That's exactly right. Mm. It's our little way of just being like. Yes, she took that wig off too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments on that show. Yeah. It's really stuck with me. Yep. Okay. So I know that we talked about this a little bit earlier, but can <laughs> you talk to me about the fashion? Because in addition to all the other titles that you can claim, <laughs> you are formally and forever a fashion icon. But we talked a little bit about how it also means more to you than that. Yeah, I, I just... I've always been a fashion person. Mm -hmm. I got it from my grandma and my great aunt. They, you know, they, they used to buy the patterns yeah. and make their own clothes. And so we were always very fashionable. Um, I, I think that there is, I know that there is activism mm -hmm. inside of fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an activist. I knew that that tuxedo dress at that tuxedo gown at the Oscars would create a conversation yeah. surrounding what gender means, yeah. what all these, all these rules we put on everybody in life for what? Yep. You know, you talked about, you know, femininity being looked down upon. That was what I spoke about the most yep. in relation to it. It's like, you know, we've gotten past a problem with women wear, wearing pants. Mm -hmm. When women wear pants, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. When men wear a dress, it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that anymore. Yep. I'm not doing it. Yep. And, I, and, and I think that we, as artists, in every aspect of whatever kind of art we have, in every aspect of whatever kind of art we have, we can, we have the power to change the molecular structure yep. of people's hearts and minds. That's right. And change the world. You know, that dress changed the world. Yes, it, it really did. did. Also, on a, on a more superficial level, I still have not come up off the floor. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Thank you. Between you, Christian Siriano, you guys outdid yourself. I mean, Thank it's you. just such an iconic moment. Thank you. On, for all of those reasons. Yeah. I mean, it, it was such a powerful statement and an incredible moment in fashion history. Thank you. And there was a, there, there, there was a specific letter that a mother sent Yeah. about how her child um, had been bullied in school. Mm -hmm. Her son had been bullied in school because he sometimes liked to wear dresses. Yeah. And um, he came... He came home from school and said, and she showed him this picture of me 
at the Oscars, and he has been wearing dresses ever since. And it just... That's cool. It's powerful. We can change stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we can change stuff. Yeah.